thank you very much uh, for having me here today and, and for the introduction. And um, firstly, I have to apologise to Robin, the cup. Um, that was a printed textiles graduate of ours who obviously didn't go to your historical and critical <laughs> studies lectures. Yeah, you know, and she never did that when she was there either, because I would never have let her away with that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, today I'm going to talk about Glasgow's Gilded Age um, and the carpet manufacturing inno innovators James Templeton and Co. And I'm, I'm a lecturer within the Department of Fashion and Textiles, and really my background's in textile design, so I'm, I'm by no means a kind of um, historian expert. Um, next slide, please. And really, I came to, to know and find out more about James Templeton and Co because of a project that took place between um, 2013 and 2014 called Interwoven Connections, the Stoddard Templeton Design Studio and Design Library. Um, and this was a, an image from the exhibition that took place at the Glasgow um, School of Art in the beloved Macintosh Museum. Um, and it's also sort of connected to a project that I've just started working on regarding the history of textile design at GSA. Next, please. So I'm going to start with um, sort of time before the Gilded Age and James Templeton, who in 1829 invested in Paisley Shaw manufacture um, and worked in this industry for, for nine years. Then in um, 1837, William Quigley, a weaver, came along to James Templeton with his shawl making process, which introduced using the chenille yarn. He took this idea to, Templeton's, um, to James Templeton, and between them they developed um, the process by adding a solid jute backing and applied for the patent um, that then um, they got awarded and became the start of James Templeton & Co. So Templeton gives up shawl making, and next slide please. And in 1839 begins James Templeton and Co. moving from Paisley to the east end of Glasgow to set up his carpet factory. Um, he called them Victoria Axminster and the operations began on King Street, which is now um, Redden Street. Next, please. So again, we're still before this period of the Glasgow Gilded Age, but it's just to give a background of, of what the company were doing in the lead up to that. In 1853, Templeton's also moved into manufacturing another form of carpet, the Brussels carpeting, using the Jacquard method. And they bought a plot of ground at Crown Point Road. Um, and a year later, the Brussels looms were installed and they developed this factory with a dye house um, to produce the Brussels carpet. In 1856, on Christmas Day, the King Street factory burnt to the ground. Um, but within one, new, one month, they'd found new premises on William Street, which was later named Templeton Street. By 1860, the power looms were introduced into the Templeton's Blood Brussels factory, and later on within this factory, they started also producing Wilton's carpeting. Next, please. And the book, A Century of Carpet Making, 1839 to 1939, by Fred H. Young, who was the former Templeton senior partner, indicates that in the period 1856 to 1878, um, the chenille weaving of carpets by Templeton's on hand looms was, was developed and brought to perfection. And at this time, Templeton produced single carpets, um, which were often elaborate designs woven for special orders. They could be made rectangular, but very often they were of elaborate shape, woven without seam to fit around windows and fireplaces. And they were expensive. Perfection of manufacturing was obtained. Um, this design you can see here, it's, it's, a, it's a more of an arts and crafts design by Voise, but you can see the kind of cutout shape that would have gone um, around the mantelpiece within the interior it was designed for. Very early on in their history, Templetons were making very famous carpets. Um, and you have the story that in 1861, Abraham Limp Lincoln entered the White House um, and Mrs. Lincoln soon turned to furnishing her new home to her own tastes. And it seems that her ideas ran to an expenditure which was considered excessive as she was criti criticised for being extravagant in spending state funds on the purchase of various articles, including a new carpet of Glasgow manufacture, ingeniously made all in one piece, which has designs of fruit and flowers in cases, wreaths and bouquets. So very early on in the company's history, they're making very big, very unique, very, very special carpets for important interiors and commissions. Next slide, please. Alongside these single carpets, they were also producing carpeting of 27 inches wide um, that were then sewn together to make larger carpets. And for many years, they produced these carpets and, and sometimes they had delicate sort of chintz effects. They were very much in demand in the US um, and, and they were sort of exporting to there as well from very early on in their, their history. Next, please. Um, during the, uh, the Glasgow Guild Age as well, they were also producing sort of smaller items, so hearth rugs, doormats, and also some furniture coverings. 
this is a slightly strange photo that you can see here from an item that we have within our archives at GSA. Next, please. Um, I think, as has been sort of mentioned already on numerous occasions, showing in these great exhibitions were part of um, very much these, these companies' um, marketing, very important to be seen. Um, and the first major exhibition that Templeton shown in, showed in was the 1851 International Exhibition, the exhibition of the industry of all nations at the Crystal Palace. They also made a carpet for the Royal Reception Room at the exhibition, uh, which I believe at, at one point was, was in the Smithsonian. So during the period of the Glasgow Gilded Age, they also showed at the 1867 Paris exhibition, and you can see here the, the Twelve Apostles carpet, which they showed there. Um, and this was a 40-foot by 18-foot carpet showing Christ standing on a pedestal surrounded by apostles on either side. Um, there's quite a lovely story that goes along with this, that a disgruntled worker um, during the manufacture of, of the, this particular carpet, because the, the design work that went to the looms was in sort of small strips, you could paint out and change some of the squares, and a disgruntled worker decided to do his own colouring in so that Peter the Apostle came out with blue hair. Um, next slide, please. So for Templeton's, um, 1878 saw major changes in the company as James Templeton, the, company found, the company's founder, retires. And prior to this time, James took his eldest son, John, Tem John Stuart Templeton, into partnership at the Crown Point Road site, and the name J&JS Templeton was used to keep the Brussels and Wilton carpet manufacture distinct from Chenille Axminster. So as James Templeton requires, John Stuart Templeton, along with other family members, become partners of James Templeton & Co. Next slide, please. Okay, so also within um, a sort of another example of an exhibition piece that they showed, Paris exhibition this time of 1878, and also around this period they were producing really kind of extravagant carpets, such as um, one for the King of Denmark that was made for the, the Danish Royal Palace, which is said to shown in the centre was the Danish Royal Palace with a border featuring animals and chintz. And they were also producing for sort of very extravagant palaces in, in India and throughout the Commonwealth. Next slide, please. Between 1883 and 1885, Templeton's also produced um, some fine silk curtains. They were woolen silk that were manufactured at their Crown Point factory. But this stopped when there was a fire in the factory that ruined and destroyed um, the equipment. But it sounds like it was also quite a good get-out point, as up until this point, um, the, the manufacturer of the curtains actually hadn't made, uh, made them any profit. Next, please. Okay, so in 1884, Chenille Axminster had been turned over to power looms, um, and except for the case of special orders for which the hand loom provided some advantage. And the development of the power looms for Chenille Axminster led the way for supplying the public with seamless carpets at prices far below what had formerly been common. Now, with a cheaper, quicker and cheaper manufacture by power, a greater number of designs and sizes were made, and so the chenille parquet trade became established, and seamless carpets, um, used only previously by the wealthy, became available to those of modest means. Next, please. So in 1888, Templeton secured also a patent to produce a small Axminster carpet, and for the new process, they required a factory that was to be built on the west side of William Street site. Um, and as I'm sure you all know, this was no ordinary factory, designed again by um, William Lepper. Um, Moorish and Italian style, based on the Palace of the Doges in Venice, um, and the, the bylaws required this, the, the decorative elevation of the, the factory. The central feature of which was a figure from St Mark's Cathedral, um, which stands in Venice beside the Doge's Palace. The construction of this building was marred by disaster when in 1889 high winds clapped the collapsed the walls to the east, which then fell into a weave shed and, and killed 29 workers. So it wasn't until 1892 that the early structure was completed um, and the rapid development of small, small Axminster carpets in this the Albert factory began. Next slide, please. So the beginning of the 1900s mark, was really marked for Templetons with this, with this expansion and by the number of workers that they had reaching 2,000. And this was used to the, small, the, the use of the small Axminster for narrow width and development of Sheerlac, Chenille Axminster for wide seamless carpets. Um, again, with this development, they required even more space. So in 1901, they created a textile factory, two and a half acres at Care Street. Um, and that lay in between the existing factories in Templeton Street and Crown Point Road. 
Next, please. Um, in the same year as this development, um, Templeton showed at the Glasgow International Exhibition and they were represented in a special building, building um, which was like an elaborate mosque. And the carpets displayed there included um, a slightly smaller scale reproduction of one of the most famous car Persian carpets of the 16th century, the Ardapool Holy Carpet. And this really marks a mainstay of the, the, the UK carpet industry in the fact that replication of existing designs, particularly from Persia, was so common. Um, and, and designs were reinterpreted, copies um, were, were created and designers were sent to museums or carpets were brought in for them to, to work and copy from. In 1906, J and J.S. Templeton merged with James Templeton & Co. and another property on Brook Street was acquired. Next slide, please. One of their major um, historical carpets at this time was in 1911 for the coronation of King George V in Westminster Abbey. Um, and it said that the throne was placed on a carpet of plain royal blue and from the entrance there was a long wide carpet in shades of blue leading to the throne. The design included the crowns with the initials G and M for George and Mary, the rose, thistle, shamrock with lotus from India, the motifs of the Order of the Garter, the Order of the Thistle and the Order of St. Patrick. And these and other emblems were combined into a well-balanced design made with specially lustrous, lustrous yarn. Okay, next please. So I'm now going to move on and talk more about the actual design studios, the designer, and, and give a bit more insight into the design process at Templeton's. This is the earliest photo. It's a photo from um, Glasgow University Archive, Serv uh, Archive Services um, of the design room at Templeton's, which is in the top of the, the Albert factory. Um, in, it, it sort of has 1927 as a mark on it, but it's actually not. It's from a lot later because of the designers in it. It's from around 1940, but it still gives an, an insight into how the designers would have worked, the desk that they would have been sat at. And it said between the, the, Gla the, the Glasgow Gilded Age that the company's history was very, very much tuned to design. It was very much at the forefront of it. And very wisely, James Templeton made designing an important feature of the business with successive head designers in the factory developing the reputation of the firm. Mr. John Lawson, who was head designer for some years before and after 1860, took a prominent part in the production of the semi-French style of the medallion carpets then in demand. Lawson left the firm in 1860 and the position was taken over by a French designer. Um, but from 1863 until 1919, the designing department was under the direction of one man, William McFadden. Next slide, please. So we can find more out about William, William McFadden from the company magazine. Um, and he entered the employment of James Templeton & Co. in his early teens in the designing department. He passed through various stages of work, including copying, drafting, planning and colouring. He also attended classes at the Glasgow School of Art and studied there under the able headmastership of Mr Robert Greenless, a man who did much to foster art in those early days. At this time, and for some years afterwards, um, Glasgow School of Art had both morning and evening classes, um, and Mr McFadden, because of the kindness of the firm, was released to be able to, to attend the classes at GSA. It's also said within this article that a short holiday to Paris quite early on in his career enabled him to lay the foundation of that intimate knowledge of the French styles that afterwards made him an authority on the various periods. Um, next slide, please. It's very difficult to talk about Templeton's and the design studio and the in-house designers without mentioning this gentleman, uh, Mr John Eady, who, this is him in, in 1950, but he entered the designing room at the age of 14 in 1882 and produced designs in many, many styles during his 75 years of service. Um, from some of the, the research that I did for the Interwoven Connections project, there were some lovely stories that came about him from people that could remember him sitting at his desk and towards his last years at the company, he'd fall asleep, paintbrush in hand. Um, and was known for that, but he obviously was very passionate about what he did and, uh, and there were uh, numerous designs with his name on them. Next slide, please. Another employee, um, both of these gentlemen worked in the design studio, but in 1893, George Adam took his place in the designing room, and that's the gentleman down here. After a short time, he was promoted to assistant foreman in the girls' designing room, and then the large room in which general designing, copying and planning were carried out. The senior men were all in a small room under the control of the head designer. When the new central building, um, the, the Albert factory was erected, all of the men were brought together and Mr Adam was there as foreman. Next please. 
We then move on to, to Frederick J. Mears, who actually joined Templeton's later in 1915, when he was in his 40s. But actually, from, the, from when he was in his 20s, he was selling designs to Templeton. He worked as a freelance designer, but also worked for firms in Kidderminster. But when he came to Templeton's, he was in charge of the London Design Studio, but he also worked in the Glasgow factory, and he could really apply himself to any style of the decorative art, and wrote um, the book Carpet Designers and Designing in 1934. Next, please. So Templeton's also bought in, as well as their in-house design team, they bought in a number of designs. Um, and the records at Glasgow University show some of, uh, really equate and show some of these books. This is a, the design register of designs bought from 1897 to 1915. Um, and you can see that listed there, there's um, Arthur Silver, UC Mayers on the list. Um, H.W. Bartley, and there's also a column that says BL or BG, meaning bought in London or bought in Glasgow. The, the amount of designs they bought in over this period is absolutely, I mean, astounding. They really did just have money to go and spend um, on designs and artwork as well as um, use the in-house team as well. Next, please. Here you can see an example of some of those designs, one from Arthur, Arthur Silver and another from H.W. Bartley. Next, please. So as well as the bought-in designs, um, Templeton, at various time, um, worked with distinguished artists and commissioned them to, to create designs for specific projects. As we've already heard today, the no name Owen Jones comes up regularly. He also designed Templeton's carpets. There was Lewis Day, Digby Watt, Charles Voisey, and Walter Crane, to name just a, a few from that period. Next, please. For Templeton's in-house designers, they also took design inspiration from a large number of books and limited edition portfolios brought into the company for reference purposes. Um, and this is part of the collection that we hold today in the design library at GSA. Publications from the period 1864 to 1914 cover a range of themes. Um, there are design classics such as the Grammar of Ornament. Next, please. And then publications by Christopher Dresser. Um, and as you've already seen, these were really about educating designers in, in what was seen to be good and bad decoration. Next, please. Within the, design, within the design library, items cover textiles, decoration, ornament, pattern, colour, interior, architecture and furniture. And it really was an amazing collection of sort of inspiration collected from around the world. Um, a lot of the items are limited edition portfolios, so they're in sort of hard covers with a ribbon tie. Some of the portfolios may have as few as sort of eight to ten um, plates in them, but others can have up to, to 200 depending on, on what they are. So they really, they also vary in size. Um, this is a, an example of a portfolio from, um, from Budapest. But there are also limited edition portfolios from around the world, Japan, China, India, um, just uh, to name a few. Next, please. Um, here's another particular favourite of mine. That's a, a collection of 18 plates of ornamental tiles from the Afghan Boundary Commission in 1884. Next, please. There are also numerous portfolios from um, French and Germany pu published in, in this time, and, and it really was a, a kind of wealth of information that, that people that travelled for the company, um, the directors would go and buy and bring back in, as well as supplying these from London um, and also from Edinburgh as well. And it was really you know, the way of buying in the design influences so that the designers of the time could see what was happening across the world. Next, please. This, this is a very faint imagery in this slide anyway. Um, sometimes the references were actually used as direct copies within the studio, but quite often they were just used to provide sort of motif designs. So within some of the items within the design library, you get sort of little drawings or evidence of paint marks or gridded lines drawn over sections where there's been a section that's been copied and used to develop a design. Um, or you'll get little notes that say things like, you know, use these colours within this design. And this kind of defacing of the design library material really gives insight into how the designers worked um, from the reference material. Next slide, please. Okay, so in, in the period of the Gilded Age, um, Fred H. Young states that designing in those days was an elaborate affair. Some of the breadth of design had repeats of nine foot or ten foot long and four foot six inches in width, requiring two breadths to show the full design. 
to secure the finest gradation of colour effects, used an enormous range of colours, sometimes as many as 250 in one design. Next, please. Okay, so moving on briefly to talk about GSA. We've already heard about Templeton designer William McFadden um, attending classes at GSA, and this wasn't uncommon. It, it tended to be for those that sort of showed the most potential. Um, the School of Design in London and the branch government schools of design were set up to train designers in the hope of proving the, quali the quality of goods manufactured. Um, and GSA was opened in 1845. And they were really opened so that um, there were day classes which were populated or tended to be populated by the middle class amateurs who were charged a higher fee than ordinary students. Um, but then there were evening schools that tended to be really crowded and busy um, for the artisan classes and others in trade employment. In 1855, the Glasgow School of Art became, sorry, the Glasgow School of Design became the Glasgow School of Art. And it said that the portion of students training industrial design, decorative trades and other design rated related employment was much higher than the national average and it was also at one point the largest school of art in the South Kensington system, no doubt reflecting Glasgow's position as a major industrial centre. During Glasgow's Gilded Age, GSA headmasters included Robert Greenless from 1863 to 81, Thomas C. Simmons from 1881 to 85 and Francis H. Newbury from 1885 to 1914. And it was really during Newbury's time that the headship of Macintosh's new school was built and also that the school became completely independent of the science and art department in London with authority to issue its own diplomas in art design and architecture and the departmental structure of the school created under Newbury's direction lasted virtually intact until 1964. Okay, very nearly there. Um, uh, the school moved into its half-completed building on Renfrew Street initially in 1899. And we see from the GSA annual reports that Templeton was very much part of um, supporting the new building by subscribing £250 to the building fund. The company also provided annual and prize fund subscriptions. Um, and we're also, James Stuart Templeton was also on the committee of management of the school. So you really see a working relationship between um, the company that was James Templeton um, and GSA. Oh, the end. Next, please. Uh.